Now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Elise Cohen, <laughs> Assistant Professor of Political Science at UW Sheboygan and UW Manitowoc. She received her PhD in Political Science and International Relations from the University of Delaware and her BA in International Relations from the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. We're very pleased to have Dr. Cohen with us to talk about refugees and global migration. Dr. Cohen. Thank you all and thank you Dulcie for the lovely introduction. I just need to make one correction and that's that uh, Sheboygan and Manitowoc are now all part of UW Green Bay. So my official title is actually Associate Professor Political Science at UW Green Bay. Um, otherwise, thank you for the, the rest of that. That was really nice of you. Thank you all for coming out on a warm September evening to talk about something rather depressing and grim when you could be in the sun strolling along 8th Street. So I I really appreciate that you are dedicated to learning about this. Um, so my goal tonight is to kind of start in a big picture way just with defining some of the key terms. What are refugees? What are migrants? Um, some of the words that often get jumbled in journalistic coverage and even by our elected officials. And then my goal is to move into some key principles that govern this topic both in international law and then impacting our own U.S. domestic law and to get a s sense of sort of uh, how things are globally with this issue, why things are the way they are. Um, and so those may seem like sort of ambitious goals, but I'm going to try to do that in a rather quick manner. So let's just start with the first one, defining some key terms. Okay, so migrant and refugee. I'm going to put up a definition here and have it be a little interactive so you can see the definitions. An individual who has moved from their place of residence either across an international border or within a state. Let's start with that one. Does anyone have a sense of whether they think that is the definition of a migrant or a refugee? Very good. Yeah, so that is the definition for a migrant. Sometimes these things get confused because uh, there's a lack of clarity. They get used interchangeably like migrants and refugees, migrants and refugees. And that's because oftentimes groups of people moving across borders are traveling in mixed flows of people. So just to be safe, you'll, us you'll usually hear that like migrants and refugees. Um, but the second definition is really important because it's very distinct from the first <coughs> definition. Um, you could see the first definition, they're just moving from a place of residence and we don't know why. So that could be any number of things, education, work, family, reunification. But if you look at the second definition, we're getting a very specific purpose of what has driven them into displacement. They have fled their country of origin due to a fear of persecution based on race, nationality, religion, political opinion, or membership in a social group. So still somewhat open to interpretation, like what counts as membership in a social group? Does domestic violence count if uh, women are part of a social group? Then there's debates, legal debates over that. But we get the sense that they are fleeing for their lives and safety, not just for better jobs or um, different opportunities of life. So that, that's one that I really do hope that you can leave tonight understanding that a refugee is a very specific term um, and this really is a humanitarian category and that's the way it should be used. To make matters even more confusing, you'll sometimes see asylum seeker and say, well, now wait a minute, if I get migrant versus refugee, how does this one fit in? An asylum seeker, the first thing you might want to think about is refugee. Because an asylum seeker is sort of a de facto refugee, they just haven't had their status formalized. So they are pursuing refugee status, um, but they officially haven't been registered with the United Nations Refugee Office or uh, whatever embassy of the country where they're seeking asylum but they are claiming asylum. They are claiming that they are fearing for their lives and escaping violence and persecution and harm. 
So both refugees and asylum seekers are a special humanitarian category of, of immigrants. We would not want to lump them in just with any kind of immigrant or migrant. Um, they are forced, meaning that they did not have much choice, if at all, in leaving their homes. So next, let's talk about why. Um, the number may sound astounding. We have over 69 million displaced people worldwide. 25 million of those are refugees. So that sounds like a huge number. Um, the reasons why are regional and global. I've just zoomed in on one region that really impacts asylum seekers coming to the US, and that is the Northern Triangle in Central America. So what this map is showing you, it's a map from the Council of Foreign Relations, is in the sort of darkish red countries there in the center, we're getting those Central American, they call them Northern Triangle countries that have the highest levels of violence, and we're seeing the homicide rate, um, basically the murder rate per 100,000 people. The deeper red is a higher murder rate so I don't know how well everybody can see in the back, so I'll just read some of that out. Um, El Salvador, which is a small country just below Honduras, uh, it's 81 per 100,000, so that would be the annual homicide rate. To give you a sense of comparison, our most dangerous cities in the US, it's something like 16 per 100,000. So you would need to really multiply that to get 81 um, per year per 100,000 people. <laughs> Honduras is 59, so also very dangerous. Uh, Guatemala and Belize also in a deeper red, 27, 37 respectively. <laughs> Bless you. Um, so El Salvador in 2015 was like the highest uh, level of violence for some country that's not actively a war zone. <clears throat> So these are the kinds of conditions when we think about why would people be leaving Central America? Um, why would we want to maybe apply the word asylum seeker and refugee to them instead of just the word migrant or immigrant? Um, and some of what's going on here, kidnappings, extortion, and violence by drug cartel members. Um, a lot of the concern about being forced to stay in Mexico as they can't safely escape those drug cartel members. Whereas if they are able to get safety and asylum in the US, they would have better protection for themselves or their families. Um, so that's looking at one region. Another major uh, center for forced migration is coming from a number of countries in the Middle East and Central Asia and even South Asia. Um, but here are a couple examples from the Middle East and um, sort of Central Asia, which Afghanistan is Central Asia. Syria. Uh, Syrian refugees make up the largest in sheer number of refugees worldwide, over 5 million Syrian refugees globally. So Syria was one of the worst humanitarian crises, only sadly to be replaced by Yemen in the last couple of years, as now being the largest humanitarian crisis in the Middle East. Um, Afghanistan, if you've even been following current events, you may have heard about um, just bombing after bombing, just sort of a relentless atmosphere of violence for the Afghan people. Syria now, we've seen that ISIS has mostly been forced out and lost their territorial control, um, but the Assad regime continues to use a lot of violence against what it views its opposition or rebels. Now there's been some discussion with ISIS losing so much control and maybe then less mass atrocity crimes being carried out. Maybe it's safer for Syrians to return. The issues that they are facing when they try to return is that the Syrian government, the Assad regime, tends to view people that fled, those five million that fled, as opposition. Well, why did you leave? Why didn't you stay and fight for my army, the Assad army? And so the stories that are, have come out, even though it's very hard to get information, uh, those are stories of arrests and torture. Another issue with returning is that uh, Syria passed a law in recent years that they could just confiscate the property of anyone who fled as a refugee. So then they could also return and they no longer have a home. Um, the final issue that they might face upon return uh, is being forced into military service. Any male between the ages of 18 and 49, when they return, would be forced to join Assad's army uh, and, and fight.
and a very brutal war that's going on within the country. So those are some of the reasons why, even though it seems like well, ISIS isn't controlling as much territory anymore, uh, it's still very dangerous and, and deadly conditions for people. Um, you know, Yemen has also been a lot in the news, so I wanted to highlight that one because, of course, the U.S. has actively supported Saudi bombing campaigns against Houthi rebels there. Um, so that's another aspect to think about is how... Oh, did I lose? Okay. Am I still with you? Huh? Okay. <laughs> that's another aspect to think about is um, how sometimes foreign powers have contributed to these conflicts that are causing the violence that people on the ground are now fleeing. Okay, so I've given you sort of some basic definitional stuff to understand on the ground, um, kind of a sense of a few examples of why these people become refugees and asylum seekers um, and not just migrants. So what responsibilities, if any, do countries have to them? Um, and this is where international law has really played an important role since the Holocaust, especially, and the Geneva Conventions. There are four main principles I'm going to go through. There's a lot more, but I'm trying to summarize the main takeaways for this evening for you. So the first one, that all countries, especially countries that have signed on to key legal instruments like the Refugee Convention, which the U.S. has ratified, uh, the Convention Against Torture, which the U.S. has ratified, and the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, which the U.S. has ratified, um, is that we should not be returning these people that are coming saying that they claim asylum and that they're fleeing persecution, we should not be returning them back to the territory where they could face harm, torture, or persecution. Um, so that's the first one. Actually, the formal legal term is non-refoulement, which is, if you know French, it just means non-return in French. Um, and so that's key. And not only that we wouldn't physically return them, but that we would prevent them from seeking asylum. That is really the spirit of the principle under international law. Um, when the U.S. ratified the Refugee Convention and its protocol, several years later, we made our own domestic law pass through Congress that made that also U.S. law in 1980. So we used this definition of a refugee I gave you earlier, and we uh, also have non-return as a legal principle that's supposed to guide our U.S. policy towards asylum seekers. <coughs> Second is non-discrimination. So in addition to not returning back to the territory where they might face harm, persecution, or torture, we should not discriminate on flows of people coming as refugees and asylum seekers based on these kinds of categories. What is their race, what is their religion, or what is their uh, ethnic national origin? Um, so the idea of saying, oh, anyone from country X should not be allowed to claim asylum, or anyone of a certain uh, religion should not be allowed to claim asylum, that would be violating this core principle that world states have agreed to since the Holocaust. Uh, the third major principle is that we should not be punishing refugees and asylum seekers for pursuing an irregular path the idea is even if they enter a territory without papers, undocumented, um, what our politicians tend to call you know, illegal immigrants, that if they are doing that because they fear their life and safety, they shouldn't be penalized in the legal system for doing that. Um, so that's another issue that we see increasingly coming under scrutiny, is what does it mean to penalize them if they are pursuing asylum but they did not have lawful entry across the border. The final one I'm going to talk about tonight is non-detention. We are also under international law not supposed to detain refugees and asylum seekers while their asylum application is underway. There are some exceptions to this if it is deemed highly necessary for reasons of a threat to public order. But what the ruling there is, is that the country should determine that on a case-by-case -case basis, and there should be independent oversight. It shouldn't be blanket, like all of these people will be detained. 
it should be this individual intelligence suggests or you know we have a concern this individual is a threat we must detain them um, so, but it should not be blanket detention it should be avoided as much as possible um, and children should never be detained um, there's also a family unity principle that comes into human rights law as well, uh, that families should not be separated during the asylum process, um, but that also kind of relates to the non-detention. So I, I could tell from the vibe in the room, some people as I was going through these, you may have been thinking about current events and saying, I'm pretty sure some countries are violating that principle. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, our, our states, our countries, right, states fulfilling these responsibilities and you're getting the, the kind of sense here, no, many of them are not. Um, and so let's give some specific examples so we can kind of bring that to life. Um, Non-refoulement, non-return. And I want to do some U.S. examples because it's really relevant to us, but also just to give you a sense some examples from other parts of the world and global politics. Um, so if we look at the Mediterranean Sea crossings, a lot of migrants and asylum seekers um, trying to flee Libya or trying to flee Syria, those areas have been crossing by boat to, to make it to Europe, to make it to asylum or safety in Europe. Um, and this is kind of giving you some figures of the number of deaths each year with those crossings. I'll read some out, especially for people that might not be able to see this well. Um, so in 2016, deaths at the Mediterranean by those migrants trying to, to cross, many of them to seek asylum, was around 5,000 people. And most of that is drowning, but some is also just exposure to elements while not being rescued and, and being stranded at sea. Um, in 2017, it appears to have gone down a bit because it was 3,000 and 2018 down a little over 2,000, but actually the rates went up because the overall numbers of people crossing went down. So then the number of people crossing went down, but the rate at which those people crossing were dying actually went up. And part of this is very deliberate because those European countries partnered with the coast guards of countries like Libya to interdict them and prevent them from arriving on the shores of the European countries. This is what I call evasion. It's a way that you can sort of find a circumvention without directly violating. So uh, Italy can partner with Libya and say, okay, we'll do an arrangement with you and give you aid if your Libyan Coast Guard goes and interdicts all of these migrants we don't want to make it to our Italian shores. Because then they could say, oh, actually we're claiming asylum and we couldn't return them. But if you do it for us on the sea with Libyan Coast Guard and then you just return them back to North Africa, then we didn't have to get our hands dirty as that European democratic wealthy country and we can be directly charged with violating international law. Um, so that's part of the story there. They uh, reduced search and rescue operations and in some cases even deployed almost like anti-rescue just specifically to find them and return them without uh, offering them shelter. <coughs> There was some uh, really powerful current events that came up. There was a case earlier this year, some of you may have heard about, where there were um, sick children that were stranded at sea for weeks because no European country would allow the rescue boat to dock in their port and allow the people to get off the boat. Again, because they didn't want them to officially be on their territory so they could claim asylum. Um, and some of those people, the conditions on the ship became so poor that they were just throwing themselves overboard and trying to swim because they thought they would die if they were left to sort of rot on the conditions of the ship. Um, so this was one that got really public media scrutiny and attention that all of these so-called democratic or wealthy industrialized countries are turning their backs and not allowing um, desperate people to claim asylum. But the bank is not Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> shall I repeat? Um, I was just saying that the European Union countries were coming under scrutiny for turning away these people that were very desperate and stranded at sea for, for several weeks. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, 
we should do to here. I just can't imagine them doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, how did they just, never mind, you don't have to answer them now. Where did they justify that? Uh, yeah. More than we do. Yes, and I promise we will do full Q&A. Um, yeah. And I'll get into some of the why, too. So maybe I might even uh, anticipate some of your questions. So um, an, a US example that many of you might also relate to is our own plan to return uh, Central American asylum seekers. It's undergone a couple of names. So Remain in Mexico is one that's being used a lot now, that we are sending them back to Mexico to then wait for their asylum process without actually being in the US, just have them stay there. Um, many of those Central American asylum seekers feel that they are still easily targeted by the drug cartels as long as they're in the Mexican territory. Um, and so many of them give up in the process or um, end up being harmed in the process. Uh, and we're still learning a lot about where exactly those people are because they don't really have enough shelter set up for the number of people, especially families that are claiming asylum. Um, the latest one is safe third country, if anyone heard that in the news. That is just hot off the presses sort of the last month that the administration is saying um, they have a deal with the Mexican government so that they must first claim asylum in Mexico, basically. Um, and if they don't claim asylum there, then they're not even eligible to apply for asylum here. So it's another really uh, amazing tactic of evasion that you can say, well, we're giving this other alternative, and it's like a, a loophole that enables us to not have to be held to these legal principles. Um, and of course, supporters of it would say they're addressing a loophole where people claim asylum just so they can get into the US. Non-detention, so this one has been so much in US coverage that I bet a lot of people in the room heard of this in the last year or even two years. Um, so the non-detention is supposed to again be something where it's not blanketed. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it's also supposed to not be prison-like conditions, but the issue is that many of our detention facilities for people awaiting their asylum process are run by private prison corporations, so they end up being very much prison type of conditions. Um, a lot of the research on you know, why this is, that it's considered a human rights violation to have prison-like conditions, is especially for children, it's psychologically very traumatic, and even physiologically, the side effects of anxiety that, that come from uh, this kind of concrete floors and um, those space blankets, if you've seen those, the foil blankets, um, and the very harsh segregation mm -hmm. and heavy surveillance, the basically lack of freedom of movement that has a very damaging mental and physical health side effects. Um, and this is not new. Uh, so under the Trump administration, there has been a lot of criticism of this, but very similar photographs to these can be found from the Obama administration as well. There was less attention to it then, so it has made its way more into mainstream coverage now. But um, this is something that stretches back quite a long time. The US has a, a long history of um, violating the non-detention principle when it comes to Central Americans especially, but also Haitians and Cubans if you go back in our history. Uh, to give you sort of another example in global politics, Hungary got a lot of scrutiny from the United Nations and from human rights groups because it was absolutely violating non-detention. Um, it was doing blanket mandatory detention for any asylum seeker, many of them children. Uh, and some of the conditions, which you can kind of see in this photo here, they were shipping containers that they were um, sort of imprisoning those children and families in while they awaited their asylum process. Uh, so it's, you know, it's not only the United States, it's a lot of these countries that are doing the detention right now. Okay, non-penalization. So I think this is where it gets really confusing in American politics. There's a sense that, well, if they cross illegally, then they simply have no rights or they should not have rights because they have violated a law by crossing the territory. 
So what we saw with the kind of crackdown on that and the sense that uh, we should enforce the law and punish anyone who crosses illegally, regardless of why they are crossing, was called the zero tolerance policy approach. Uh, and under Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who was there until last year, now it's Bill Barr, who's our current Attorney General. Um, this got a lot more media attention. It's kind of fallen out, I would say, in the last few months. Um, but you know the separation of families got such public backlash it was halted after a few months and um, by executive order by President Trump uh, he said you know we're, we're not going to have that as an official policy anymore there's still controversy because the idea was to deter them from coming in the first place we should give them such a harsh punishment that we make them regret crossing to seek asylum um, so the idea of deterrence is another one that sort of directly violates that non-penalization because because why is it that the policy logic was intended to um, separate the families? It was so they would think twice about coming in the first place to try and seek asylum in the United States. So that would be a direct example of violating the non-penalization principle that is not supposed to punish if they are fleeing for their lives and safety and that's why they were sort of forced to take an irregular route or felt that they couldn't wait to go through a regular normal process. There have also been a tightening of the asylum policies in a way that punishes those who cross irregularly. Um, so this was one that came out last year. The uh, administration Department of Justice issued a rule that said immigration officers can actually penalize someone's application if the way they crossed was irregularly, without documentation, without authorization. So that's another example of this is really intended to punish, to deter them from crossing. For non-discrimination, uh, if anyone has heard of the Rohingya who are in South Asia, very good to see some of you nodding along. Um, they are a Muslim minority group and this is a largely Hindu dominated and Buddhist dominated series of governments that are turning them away or violating their human rights. Um, and so the Rohingya Muslims of Burma and Myanmar have face discrimination from countries like India, which even though India is a democracy, it currently has sort of a Hindu nationalist party governing it under Modi. Um, and so the Rohingya have been scapegoated. Um, they have been denied a lot of basic rights, education, housing. Um, in some cases, their UN, United Nations refugee cards taken away from them so that they can't get access to basic humanitarian services, um, as well as forced deportation uh, of the Rohingya. So it's something that we see in all regions, this problem of either religious or national origin shaping the way governments respond and treat uh, different asylum seekers or refugees. Um, in the case of the Rohingya, we actually use the term genocide to describe the conditions they are fleeing in Burma or what's also called Myanmar. Um, not only in cultural genocide, but even like violence, targeting them with physical violence to destroy them as uh, a migrant, or I'm sorry, a minority group. Uh, we can see this with a national origin in something that I don't know how much people even remember now because it was f feels like a long time ago, but 2017, uh, when we had the travel ban, as it was called. Um, it got changed a few times through the battles in the courts, but this is where it ended up, and it is still in force today, so that's an important thing to remember. Um, six countries, blanket bans, Six countries, uh, blanket bans on migration from those countries, including refugees and asylum seekers. So that would be a blanket ban by national origin, uh, which is one of the tenets we are not, <laughs> sorry about this, I, I don't know <laughs> what's up with the mic, uh, but this is one of the tenets that we're, we're not supposed to be violating with this kind of uh, legal order. Venezuela is there, but not for every Venezuelan, just for certain Venezuelan government officials. Um, some people also argue there's a religious element because five of the six countries that were covered were Muslim majority. Um, again, technically in the courts, that didn't hold up because there are over 50 Muslim majority countries and you know not all of them were Im impacted by the ban. Um, but it, it just so happens that five of the six that have countries with blanket bans 
do send the most Muslim uh, refugees or asylum seekers as part of the global forced displacees. Um, this is probably the one that is on shakiest ground in terms of international law and cooperation, and that is a principle of responsibility sharing. It is in the Refugee Convention. It is something that is expected of countries but was left very purposefully vague when it was written in the 1950s and even revised with the protocol in 1967. So we don't have a clear legal standard where we can say, hey, United States or India or Hungary or Japan, you're not taking in enough refugees or you're not sharing your fair share of your obligations to help asylum seekers. There is no number. There is no percentage of your population or factoring in your wealth level. There's nothing like that that's set in stone in international law. So it really is leaving it open to each sovereign state, each country, to decide what its refugee policy and asylum policy will be for those types of migrants. This is uh, the only wording that we have in the actual refugee convention, which these countries like the US have ratified. Uh, there should be international cooperation and solidarity. So I don't know how often you've been part of a group that needs to get something done and you say, well, let's just have solidarity and how well that goes for you <laughs> in allocating who's going to do what. Um, we'll figure it out and we'll just all work together. It sounds really nice, but often it doesn't result in tangible allocations and division of labor of you know who's going to help and how many. Um, so that's part of the problem is we don't have something specific where we can point to that and tell a country, oh, you're violating this. So so really a country can take as few refugees and asylum seekers as they want as long as they find ways to not blatantly violate some of those principles perhaps. And this is what we've seen as a global movement, is to reduce the number of refugees that are accepted, to uh, find ways to prevent asylum seekers from even arriving on your territory so that they can't technically legally claim asylum from persecution. On the left is an example from the Hungarian border um, where they've built a really high-tech border wall with thermal, dynamic, like heat sensor cameras, all of that stuff. Um, and they ha also closed their border a couple years ago, just completely shut the border. Um, they're a much smaller country than a country like the US, but they felt that there were too many migrants and asylum seekers coming from uh, Serbia, so they just even closed their border. Um, this is from an immigration po protest on the right side in the U.S. Uh, you know, calls to close our borders because of uh, fear that we are having a crisis or unprecedented levels of people coming in. Um, and so there is a commonality actually in showing you those two. The U.S. and Hungary were the only two countries in the World Forum on a global compact for refugees that voted no. Uh, just in a general resolution of solidarity to do better about responsibility sharing, the U.S. and Hungary said no, we're not even going to commit to the words of solidarity and responsibility sharing. Um, so they actually have, have that in common. So what has happened with responsibility sharing of refugees and asylum seekers globally is that it's highly unequal. Uh, right now, roughly 87% of the world's refugees are hosted by the poorest or at least if not lowest income, middle income countries that have less resources and often have very fragile institutions. Um, so these are not the best and safest places for the refugees to be hosted, but that ends up happening because those wealthier countries with more resources can do things like interdiction at sea or um, you know, pay a, a, an ally country to block them from making it to their territory um, or do something like set up a safe zone. And so it sounds nice to the public. We're keeping them safe but also far away. Uh, and so those are some of the reasons that, that we see that vast inequality of like who's actually doing the responsibility sharing is some of the poorest countries in the world. This is just one example with Syrian refugees because again, they're the highest number right now in total, over five million Syrian refugees. Um, 
you can see 95% from this graphic are hosted just in those handful of Middle Eastern countries. Um, and, and you know, that surprises some people because they hear so much, or at least in our election, our last presidential election, heard so much about Syrian refugees. One might think, oh, you know, just the Europe and Canada and the US are just taking them all. Um, but it's very, very few of them. Most of them are in Turkey and Lebanon. Actually, Lebanon right now, every fourth person is a Syrian refugee. So it's like 25% of their population right now is just Syrian refugees, which uh, they are not happy about. Here's another way visually of getting at that vast inequality and responsibility sharing of refugees where you can see the darker shade of the country means they're hosting more. And so those countries hosting the most, you might get that theme. Um, Pakistan, they're taking a lot of Afghani refugees because after Syrians, Afghanis are the second largest number of refugees worldwide. Um, Turkey and Lebanon hosting mostly Syrian refugees. Ethiopia hosting a lot from Somalia where there's been terrible violence and humanitarian catastrophe and also South Sudan uh, where there's been uh, genocide and, and war crimes. This is just a focus on our own country since that's relevant to US foreign policy and really fits well with why we're here tonight thinking about these great decisions uh, countries like the US are faced with in our policy making. And you can kind of see over time at the top line which is I think a sort of greenish <laughs> the way I see it. It's the number of refugees that the US accepted in every year as part of our refugee resettlement program, which was very much a foreign policy kind of program for us. It was sort of like if we like your government, then we're probably not going to recognize your refugee. But if we don't like your government, then we would love to say you're a refugee and welcome on over here to show how bad your government is, aka communist government, right? So that we could say those people are voting with their feet and they're leaving because communi communism is so terrible. So over time, um, We've had kind of an average of roughly 100,000 per year of refugees we would accept, special humanitarian category of migrants. Um, it, it sort of dipped down for a little bit right after 9-11 as we reorganized our entire uh, kind of homeland security system. We created a Department of Homeland Security we didn't have before that, we re redid all of our immigration and, and customs and border protection, um, but then quickly kind of rebounded once we got the organizations in place. And if you notice the very end, that's the really fascinating part. That's where a lot of my own research is focused right now, and the book I'm working on is focused. So what you can see at the very end is the major drop-off, and that's because we are at the uh, lowest level of refugees we have ever accepted, um, actually three years in a row now. So um, th to give you a sense of this, we haven't taken so few refugees in since 1977. And it continues to decline, like last year it was ended up being around 24,000, uh, whereas prior I told you the average was about 100,000 a year. Um, some people like that. Hello? Hello? Jeez. All right. Okay, I'm back with you. All right. We'll just, we'll work together, we'll switch, we'll do what we need to do, it's solidarity, we'll figure it out, you know. Um, okay, so uh, we continue to see that drop off. For people that support that, they say, well, that's a good thing that we're not taking in. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm going to put this one over here. Any Game of Thrones fans, Game of Mics? I don't know. <laughs> that was a bad one. <laughs> So what could be going on here is very interesting. When we compare our population size to the population of our neighbor to the north, Canada, um, we have a roughly 10 times larger population than Canada. But for the first time last year, Canada surpassed us in taking more refugees in sheer number. 
So that's really amazing that you know we were taking in roughly 24,000. Canada actually brought in 26,000, but they just have about 36 million people. We have 330 million people. Um, so that's really fascinating to see that kind of contrast and to recognize the extent to which there really are not these clear standards. There's no way to hold a government accountable to ref uh, refugee responsibility sharing. And so I want to get to sort of the why. And I think this is where we, we might see more questions. You know, why would this be happening? That there's this global trend of countries um, closing borders more, wanting to find a way to prevent people from even seeking asylum in the first place on a technicality, something like that. Um, I really think what I've learned from my research is that the first one is the overarching key driver. And then number two and number three end up supporting the first one. And so that is the domestic politics in that country. Whether it's India and uh, Modi's regime there, or whether it's uh, the Lebanese government using Syrian refugees as a scapegoat in Lebanon, um, or a US administration or elected officials here using Syrian refugees or Central American asylum seekers. Um, it really seems to be the uniting theme is that it is politically very helpful and expedient to say we should be taking less people, migrants in general, and that even applies to a humanitarian category. It used to be that refugees were separate from the immigration debate, but now they're part of it. And so even refugees should not be free from um, that restriction, that move towards restriction. And that is something that's kind of changed in the last five years or so, that refugees would now be viewed just like any type of migrant, that they should really be restricted and uh, not allowed into the country. Um, I don't know if anyone knows who this is on the right. He's no longer in power technically, because a scandal just happened with something last month. Does anyone know? It is in Italy. If you know Italian, maybe that was a clue. Salvini. <laughs> Salvini was there as a minister with the coalition government, but then last month he took a risky move and he lost, and so now he's out. Um, but isn't that amazing? His campaign, Stop the Invasion, sounds very much like a lot of politicians when they run on a kind of restrictionist platform, that we should be taking less of these people in, or that these people are a burden to us, or that they are even a national security threat to us. Um, and, and so he used that invasion rhetoric, which is very powerful and, and helped him. He was able to basically triple his support at the political level when he focused on Italy should be taking less of these migrants. Um, you know, put our people first. That uh, other idea of putting the native people, the people that are born in the country, before these migrants. So that's something that really plays well to a political audience, number one. Um, we do see after 9-11 that there has been sort of a global move to link immigration more to terrorism and national security <laughs> threats. It's kind of intensified. Um, but even the way it gets used ends up being for political purposes. There's a lot of fear that you'll hear, especially in US immigration debates about open borders. Well, are some people just moving towards open borders? Do they want um, people coming freely everywhere without any safety and protection? And so I find this graphic to be quite striking in thinking about um, whether open borders may be a danger at the moment. And this is a, a study that was done that counted every border fortification, every wall, basically, that has been erected for immigration control since 1945. So they went back to 1945, and then the study ended around 2016. Um, and what you can see is that this is a recent trend. You know, some people will think about the Ming Dynasty building the Wall of China, um, which actually had a lot of failures and has been in some ways resurrected for tourism purposes. Um, but you know, you can point to things in the Old Testament and so on and say, well, there's always been walls. But uh, national governments building walls to keep out immigrants is something kind of new just in the last few decades or uh, half of a century. And then I find it particularly fascinating that we get to about, oh, I can move now. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> um, I'm just pointing to where we're seeing a big spike, and it's around 2008. 
So 2008 is where you see that the number of walls that they're tallying in the study just spikes way up. And so between that time, like I think in all of Europe, the study said before that there were five border fortifications, and then that went up to like 30, just in a matter of four or five years. Um, so this is the trend now. And some people say it's very politically useful because you can just point to it if you're an elected official or you know, some type of politician and say, well, look, I've built a wall. I've done something tangible that you can see. And I'm showing you that physically I'm protecting our homeland security and protecting you. Um, so it's something that's kind of easy to do. It's not that hard to construct. Um, you know, and it really resonates with people. They feel like it is tangible. It brings people comfort. And so that is part of the logic of why we've seen that as a tactic go up by governments. It's just um, actually erect a physical barrier and that helps people feel much safer and feel like you've really taken action and done something. Uh, when we think about why it is that we move away from humanitarian views, you know, why is it that refugees and asylum seekers have now become lumped in with um, undocumented migrants of all kinds? It is something that's always been with us, so I don't want to gloss over that and make it seem like there was this golden age where we were just opening our arms you know, to all sorts of migrants. That's actually a photo from 1930. Um, that says, you know, Mexicans keep going. We, we can't even take care of our own, so keep walking. So we, we have a lot of this in our history, as do many countries. Um, but there is something new and intensified about the level to which they are being linked with national security threats or uh, burdens to the economy. It's sort of reaching new peaks. So I would say it's been with us as a historical theme, but it's, it's really intensifying. Um, this was part of Brexit, British jobs for British workers. So again, this is really expedient to say, I'm protecting you, the native-born people of the country or the citizens of the country, by protecting your jobs from being taken by these refugees or asylum seekers or, or any kind of migrant that isn't born here. There is some cultural element, though, that where it's, it's not just uh, about sort of the economics. There's also a sense of these people may be a threat in terms of the values or beliefs or identity. Um, so this was a billboard where we could see why support the travel ban. It was a billboard put up in defense of that ban. And it linked back to 9-11, but then it specified that those were Muslim attackers. And it actually then sort of tacitly acknowledged the ban was in part about religion because five of the six countries were Muslim majority. So recognizing that is a way that we could prevent more Muslim people from coming here as migrants. And linking those together, Muslims, national security, they sort of link the culture in that billboard with the security public safety threat. And so that's another thing very effective, you know, people driving by uh, thinking about, yeah, that, that is a good logic, not just security, but also a religious element. <coughs> Yeah, this really depends what media outlets you consume. And so I don't know, I'm sure there's a lot of diversity in the room, um, but this is RushLimbaugh.com. And Rush Limbaugh was using that language of invasion, which is very powerful. This was last year with the, quote, caravan, if people remember that, the migrant caravan. Um, and this was a group of people walking, but there's an El Salvador flag. Um, and so this photograph, very powerful on the website, that um, these people are not just coming you know, in terms of an economic or security threat. This is like a cultural threat. They're going to invade the country with their own different values or different way of life or different language. Um, and so I think that's another thing. Depending on, again, what media you consume, it will be interpreted very differently if an asylum seeker is deserving of protection or if they're um, just trying to commit fraud and sneak in like a Trojan horse to invade the country. But uh, regardless, this is becoming more popular to kind of see that invasion language. Um, the way I like to sort of wrap up this evening is something that I feel often gets left out of this kind of presentation, and that is that we don't really have the voices of actual migrants and refugees very often shaping our conversation. They're more like props, they're more used as examples or they're pictures that we, you know, especially elected officials love to have. Um, but what are their stories? What are their perspectives? That's actually a place I would say we could learn a lot more and bring them much more into this discussion. 
Um, this is just one example. So the conversations about uh, Central American asylum seekers or migrant caravan, uh, you really don't hear much about, well, who are some actual people that were refugees from Central America in the 80s and then made a life here? What ended up happening to them? What is their life like? What did they contribute? Um, and this is kind of a cool story that I, I like because <coughs> that is the sun and the father is also an artist. The father did the painting in the top left, and then the son did the painting in the bottom right. And so his father came as a refugee, a Salvadoran refugee, in the 80s from the violence in Central America and El Salvador in particular. Um, and then he grew up here, right? So he's born here, raised here. Um, but that refugee experience also shaped him, and he continues his father's tradition doing art. Uh, and he, he really tries to link his art to that refugee identity that, that came with his family family when they fled for their safety. Um, you know, what are the perspectives of people that have built their lives here that were refugees? So this is actually a recent and very close, geographically close example. It's a family in Milwaukee that opened a refugee, Syrian refugee run a restaurant and they even hire you know, a lot of people in the area so they're kind of an economic contributor in that way. Um, so, you know, what is their story? What is, we don't really hear much for them, right, in these policy debates. It's mostly people talking about them, but we tend to not really hear what kind of experiences they've had. I would say if you're interested in exploring and if you're open to hearing more of the stories from the people themselves instead of um, just like people debating the policy of it, uh, this is Behruz Bouchani. He's, his name is at the top there. He has a new book that came out last year, No Friend But the Mountains. And it won Australia's literary prize, even though he is legally forbidden from entering Australia. He spent five years writing it, and uh, you know, as a professor, and I'm writing my own book, and I'm always working on research in addition to teaching, I can easily complain about something, you know, I'm running out of time or whatever, but he actually wrote the whole book by text message while being detained. So, I mean, I really have, like, no excuse when I'm <laughs> complaining because at least I have, you know, a computer, at least I, I have a, you know, computer um, and safety and... Uh, freedom over my own movement. Um, so he actually had to sort of sneak that out by text message uh, on different phones, and it took him five years to write it. But it, it's called No Friends But the Mountain. He's an Iranian Kurd that fled Iran from persecution, but then was detained on Manus Island. Australia is another country that's violated the non-detention quite a bit, um, and they keep them on Papua New Guinea territory, so they say, well, it's not technically Australia, so we're not technically refouling them, returning them, or, or violating principles. Um, and so he was one of those on Manus Island. He's still there, and he's able to access a phone occasionally and tweet and so forth, but uh, he still uh, does not have freedom. But his book, No Friend But the Mountains, is really powerful. So if you are open, you know, after kind of thinking about this and want to hear something not just policy, but more like what are the lived experiences of the migrants and refugees, um, it's, it's one that is really quite vivid. So uh, I think the last thing I'll say before I open it up to Q&A is that in American politics, this whole conversation about migrants and refugees today is very much a partisan issue. And it makes it very hard to talk about, especially to talk about in civil terms, because now, as you can kind of see on the left, um, it's basically just Republicans versus Democrats have taken these polar opposite stances on key issues about migration and even refugees, which wasn't the case five years ago. Um, so it just makes it harder because once political identities are involved and political parties are involved, you know, people feel more of a personal emotional stake in the argument. Uh, and so that's one thing that I think makes it a struggle for scholars and researchers is now this is all wrapped up in like the two competing major parties that we have. Um, and the one on the right is in case there were some questions of just numerically, what kind of crisis is there at the southwest border? You know, how does it compare to the past for people migrating or uh, seeking asylum? And you can kind of see the highest numbers peaked earlier uh, in the 1990s was when we had some of the greatest numbers of people. But I would say the biggest difference is a lot of them were single men, whereas today a lot of it is families and children and even unaccompanied children. 
So uh, I put a little dot. I don't know how well you can see it. There's an orange dot. That's my way of putting a little update that didn't exist in the visual, but I still want to give you the visual. But then I looked up the actual numbers. That's the latest fiscal year uh, 2019, which ends this month. So we, we can have like the latest data. Um, so it has really spiked. It has spiked up to 800,000 apprehensions of people trying to cross in the southwest border of the US. The issue is that 65% of that 800,000, according to our own government data, those are families and unaccompanied children. And that is something new that we're not set up for. Um, and, so, and a lot of them are claiming asylum. Uh, so that really makes this especially challenging. So I think now I'll open it up to Q&A. Thanks for listening. Let's hope the microphone will work. We'll, we'll try, <laughs> try to get them. If you use the mic, speak right. You have to hold it right here. Yeah. Yes, otherwise, if you hold it here, you don't hear it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> questions, anybody? Oh. <laughs> or comment? <laughs> Nobody? Oh, there's oh, yes. Well, one of the things that you said was that if a person's life is at stake, yeah, and I, I'm thinking people that are starving because of climate crisis and there's not water for their crops and they can't feed themselves and they know that there's probably a good possibility they will at least have food in the richest country on the planet, they would move this way and hope that we take them into our uh, country with gentleness and kindness and generosity. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, a great question because one of the biggest areas of criticism about that definition I showed you at the very beginning of the presentation was the political nature of the persecution because only a government can persecute, the climate can't persecute, like under international law. But then we know, as you're saying, the real lived experiences of people, uh, in many cases they are fleeing for survival. So if we look at like the Pacific Island examples, like Kiribati, you know, where they will be underwater uh, within a matter of years. The clearly to survive, you know, you would need to to go somewhere else and get refuge. Um, but that is one of the biggest gaps that we see, where those people truly lack even any legal protection that we would see refugees get. And we already saw how hard it is now for refugees to, to be accepted. Uh, so climate refugees, I agree with you that it is sort of the latest cutting edge global problem, but we really lack any international solutions and countries don't even want to go there because they already don't want to um, have to be forced to share responsibility for the political persecution. So then if you bring in the climate, it, it creates uh, other layers. Okay. I'd, li I'd like to ask a question of the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, is it? Okay, sorry, <laughs> yeah. I, um, I'd like to ask a question of the group. How many of you have ever met a migrant, an immigrant, or refugee, or did you ever have one in your family, in your immediate family? Yeah. Um, I was wondering, since we have these, you, you talked sort of at the beginning about these sort of international treaties that we've signed on to, is there any kind of attempt or way to enforce those? I mean, do we have to storm the Hague? I don't know. Um, so oh, wow. if we've signed on to these things, how, uh, it, not just the United States, but other countries, for example, Italy, France, et cetera. That is a great question. So if you know about treaties, a lot of times they have an enforcement mechanism, some independent body that monitors and regulates countries. Like, uh, well, right now, the discussion of Iran's nuclear uh, program, it's because the IAEA is a monitoring body that holds countries accountable if they violate the protocols of, you know, the non-proliferation treaty, the NPT. So the human rights, in the human rights treaty area, the Refugee Convention is the only treaty that doesn't have an oversight enforcement body. 
So there is literally no organ that you can go to to uh, monitor and evaluate and issue year yearly reports. There's nothing like that. We just rely on NGOs and basically the United Nations a High Commissioner for Refugees who give statements, you know, and condemns certain things maybe. But then it's really hard because countries like the U.S. and the European Union countries, they're the highest donors. And the United Nations Refugee Commission is entirely voluntary donations from countries. So if I really go after you and I criticize like those numbers I showed you with the huge drop in refugees or uh, detaining uh, asylum seekers, you know, then you could say, oh fine, well how about I give you zero dollars next year for your budget, United Nations. Um, and so it's very hard to enforce because uh, it's the situation with the United Nations and the treaty itself lacking any enforcement oversight agency. It's a great question. Uh, um, you've identified, uh... Yeah, you, you, did, uh, you had identified the major, uh, like there's a 65% increase in the uh, Southwest um, immigrants, uh, mainly families and single uh, individuals. What, uh, uh, have you identified any contributing factors why uh, this has come about, whereas before there were mainly single men? Yeah, great question. So why is it that we're now at 65% uh, of those border apprehensions being families and unaccompanied children? Um, so a lot of it is that the, it tracks really well with the rise in violence in the Northern Triangle countries. There has been an uptick in violence by the cartel in those countries. Um, even countries that we have meddled directly in in the last decade, we see that they have widespread corruption. The institutions themselves are very weak. It means that people don't feel they can call call the police and say, look, someone's threatening my family that they're going to kill us if we don't give them you know, half of the money we make from our store. Because they can't, because the police will actually be in on that, or they'll be corrupt, or they will themselves end up trying to extort the family. Um, and so it really is an issue of the law and the institutions in those Northern Triangle countries are not equipped to deal with the drug cartel. And, and US policy is part of the story. So I would just encourage people, if you want to look back at our, our history in the 1980s and 90s of how we intervened directly, like a lot of the weapons in circulation the cartel uses are left over from our sort of proxy wars um, to fight against communist sympath what we thought left as communist sympathizing governments. Um, and then the widespread corruption and fragile institutions because of the remnant, the legacy of uh, when we were intervening so heavily to support dictators there. The other part of it with the drug violence, you know, why has the drug violence gone up so much? We focus so much on cracking down on drug violence in Mexico and Colombia that we just sort of pushed it into the Central American countries. So like focus so much on let's let's eliminate Mexican and Colombian bases. Uh, we actually just redirected it. So they got a huge influx of drug activity that they didn't have, you know, maybe 15 years ago. Um, and you know, 90% of the cocaine that's flowing through there is coming to meet our American demand for cocaine. So that's the other thing, our demand is also going up right now. So uh, there's just so many contributing factors to why the uptick in the violence in Northern Triangle, but um, I do encourage people to kind of dig into the US history of our policies there, because there is a hand to play. So this isn't particularly a question, but I am Angelica Zaitlo and I am a teen in our community and right now I am working on a public event to help refugees and to help others understand the difference between migrants and refugees that are vulnerable and need our help. And yeah, and here's my partner. I'm helping her. <laughs> I'm helping her and I um, I don't know a lot about this, but I appreciate her heart, and I want to work at it. And and I guess why we're standing up also is because this event is going to be October 26th, and she has gotten her um, theat theater teacher Deb Sable Williams to help, and she has gotten a lot of people involved, including her church, 
will um, give her the money to host the event at the Senior Activity Center. And um, it's going to be October 26th. So um, I bought a website, and I've been working really hard at it. And, and I've come to a, a, a position where I feel like I, I put it out there, but it's not as good as I would like it to be. And I was just wondering if, if anybody would um, know how to help us with that part of it. <laughs> and um, what, what is the name of it? Um, journey, it's going to be um, a journey of a ref, what is the name? The website or the name of the event? Either one. Okay. Um, journey of a refugee and is going to be the name of it and she has gotten a couple of Syrian teens involved, refugees, and they want to share their experience as a refugee and um, and she's been involved with theater and um, feels that this is a, way, a great way to teach our community about refugees. And um, she, I, I'm really excited about the event. Um, it's going to be an alternative to a haunted house. And, um, and it's going to be, thank you. <laughs> And um, the website, um, I wrote it down somewhere in here. But, <laughs> but maybe we can talk about it later. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And I think if, uh, if people notice where they're standing and then after the talk, people that are interested in learning more and helping out can make their way over to that part of the room and you can hang out there for a moment. I, I think a lot of people would be interested to talk to you. Thank you. That's what I was interested in, more details. You've given us the date, the time, the place. Of, of what schools are you from? Um, I'm from North High School, and it's going to be October 26th. And there's going to be two times, 12.30 like and 3 o'clock, 12.30 well, and 3 o'clock at the Senior Activity Center. All oh, right. Mm -hmm. And where are you advertising this on your website? Flyers. Or? We've made flyers and we're handing them out um, as soon as that website is more presentable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, wonderful. Thank you. What are the numbers for actual applicants for refugee status? And how have they changed over the last several years? So I don't have the exact numbers. I didn't pull that data for tonight. But you can do a search where you do asylum applications and CBP. And it, you can go directly to the Customs uh, CBP, Customs Border Protection website. And they will tell you f for fiscal year each year the number of applications. So it should be publicly available. Because I get the sense that there has been a huge increase in the number of applications for refugee status. And part of the reason for the drop in the number of legal recognition of refugee status is that they are all jammed up and tied up with the immigration courts. Yeah, there is a tremendous backlog in the asylum hearings right now. Um, something like 800 judges short, or some estimates that I've heard, that if we could even focus um, more on funds for more judges, that that would be a way the on-the-ground people that are dealing with the, the number of family units and the number of unaccompanied minors uh, could, could process them. It's like we don't have enough people to actually handle the cases. But the other side of it is the judges we do have, they 
just had new regulations go into effect on their own merit and uh, career quality kind of promotion stuff. Um, the last couple of years, they have to increase the speed with which they hear every asylum case so that they end up just having maybe like a day or two, uh, or in some cases, three hours to issue their decision on an asylum case. So even the judges have really pushed back that um, not only are there, there are not enough of them, but then they're forced to make decisions so quickly that they're not able to fully evaluate and hear out the person's evidence of persecution. So yeah, if you really want to dig in the weeds of some of the problems, there are so many, but one of them de definitely is at the judicial level in our immigration court system. And the pushback there, as I understand it, and I don't know, but intuitively I'm thinking, are we able to say that there are more denials of application or are they just backlogged? Which then gets us back to the question of detention are people being detained simply because of the backlog and because of the uh, overwrought circumstances on the facilities available, it becomes incarceration. It becomes a forced uh, separation of families as opposed to a deliberate policy. And if we are able to focus our resources or bring more resources to bear to address the situation in the court system to move them forward, that should reduce the pressures all along the system. There's a couple uh, parts to that answer. So on the denial of applicants, there are actually studies published that have looked at that and the denial rate has gone up. The denial rate has actually gone up since even 9-11 um, with a lot of things that don't correlate to evidence of persecution, but even uh, uh, what is the language, is the language the person speaks Arabic uh, rather than French. Uh, so all sorts of arbitrary things going into it. Um, but the denial rates have gone up overall. Um, but the part about, you know, is could we get around the detention if we just had more facilities? In part, that, that could help because we know we have a shortage, especially for families and children in the proper kinds of care that they would need. But then the other part is that we also have um, evidence that it is deliberate to punish them by putting them in really t harsh conditions uh, because we have the statements of the officials that are behind those policies saying uh, and we need to make it so that they really are not enjoying their time while they're waiting. So even if we had more, fa I guess the thing is that maybe they wouldn't want to invest the resources you're bringing up if part of it is that they want to deter them from coming in the first place to claim asylum. But yeah, it's it is a very complicated series of things, not just one thing. Excuse me. Um, I'm getting the impression over the last decade or so that we're getting. Yeah, okay, I'll. I hope I won't blast people out. Um, I'm getting the impression of the last decade or so that we're getting an increase in uh, bellicose nationalist um, uh, governments, um, headed by kind of a strongman kind of a, a thing. I'm, I feel parallels with the 30s, but in those I think they were more economic. Uh, and, but I'm, I'm getting the impression that refugees are being used as a tool to help such governments grow and increase. And I don't see an, an end to that. I'm, I'm looking at an increase in that. What are your feelings on that? Yeah, that's another one that where it's your finger's really on the pulse of a lot of latest research. It's called populism, this idea that you package the anti-immigrant message in a way that's like, I'm helping the people, the ordinary hard-working people that are paying taxes and just trying to make it, but then these migrants are coming in and taking government benefits. And that is very expedient, and I think part of it is a learning process. We're so globalized and we're so interconnected with social media that it's very easy to, for one leader to learn from another very quickly, oh, that tweet was really successful. That policy really produced a, a lot of support and love by their constituents. Um, and so we do kind of see whether it's Modi in India or whether it's Salvini in Italy um, or you know the Brexit rhetoric, it, it really does have a lot in common with what we would hear from restrictionists. So yeah, it's like the globalization of populism, I, I think you could call it. You're absolutely right. Do we have time for more? Can I have one question yet? 
is it is it possible that if is it possible if the United States of America, us, the United States of America, the richest, the richest country on the planet, whose military pollutes more than any other organization on the planet, and with all the money we have, if we actually became aware of what the rest of the planet knows, that climate climate crisis is here. We haven't heard the scientists on our, on our news station say that. We have 11 years to get this right. And we haven't heard on our news stations the, the weather reporters say, you know what they're experiencing right now you know, in Puerto Rico or what they're experiencing in California or what they're experiencing in the Amazon. These are all things that are contributing or made much, much worse because of climate crisis. So when our country allows people to become educated, is it possible, do you think, that this country, with people that actually care about other people on the planet, um, because there is only one human species and that's all of us, do you think that it's possible we could change the way this looks? If we become <laughs> vegetarian. <laughs> well, that's another, that's another whole topic, uh, climate change. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cohen, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you all for coming out. I always look forward to your presentation. Thank you.